everybody. This is David Hurd. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Secure Logics and the sometime CEO of TechBlock. I'm here with TechBlock co-founder Lorenzo Gomez. Uh, and we have an exciting session uh, today for you. This is uh, San Antonio Startup Week 2020 Community Spotlight event <clears throat> featuring the new book release by Lorenzo Go Gomez uh, for his new book called The Rack We Built. It's a story about, you guessed it, rack space, but it's more importantly a story about corporate culture and core principles uh, and values that I think would be, uh, that will be very instructive for everybody. Uh, and with that, I'd like to welcome Lorenzo. Let me introduce him briefly. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, Lorenzo is, uh, uh, serves as chairman and, and uh, CEO of uh, the 8020 Foundation and Geekdom, the co-working space downtown, is also founder and CEO of Geekdom Media. Uh, he's also the author of two previous books, uh, The Cilantro Diaries, Business Lessons for, from the Most Unlikely Places, and Tafoya Toro, Three Years of Fear. Lorenzo, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. David, come on. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited uh, to get this party started. So I'm just being a part of Startup Week is, is awesome. So thanks for having me. You know, it's you and I are good friends. We joke around all the time. I can't believe they left us alone on a Zoom call together to talk serious business issues. They have, they must be crazy. Who knows what trouble we're going to start. I mean, <laughs> we might get born right now. So everybody watch out. We'll try to behave That's right. um, as best we can. Um, Lorenzo, many congratulations on the completion of your latest book. Um, I've read it twice. Uh, you were generous enough to let me take a peek at it. Um, and of course it was, it was launched earlier this week on Tuesday. Um, it's available on Amazon and download on Kindle and the like, is there anything you'd like to share uh, with people about where they can get it and how they should try to get it? Yeah. I mean, I think Amazon is, uh, the best place to get it now, you know, I'm going to try to get it into some local bookstores here. I think, uh, uh, Felice Modern and the Twig have always been real good to, to me in the past with my books, but Amazon's the best way uh, anybody wants to get a hold of it. And then I need to get in the studio quickly and start recording the audiobook because uh, there are some people in my family that won't read it until it's in audio form, so. Very good. Well, all kinds of ways to get it, in, and I found the book to be an amazing read, um, filled with a lot of uh, fantastic stories, but also tremendous business knowledge. And that leads me to uh, the first question I'd actually like to, to start with is a little bit about you. Because when you and I first met, ironically or coincidentally, it was at a conference room at Rackspace. It was the meeting that ultimately led to us creating Tech Block, whole nother story. Um, however, that was 2013 and about a year later, I was working on a presentation and I came over to you for some help, for some consult on how to build it. And I was so struck by your ability to, to tell stories and, and, and put narratives together that I remember asking you uh, what your career goals and plans were longer term. And without hesitating, you said, one of the things you said was, I'm gonna author books. And not a year after that, you started working on your first book. So I, I guess I'm kind of interested in when that interest began in terms of writing your own books. Anything that's developed, this is now your third book, so you have kind of a body of work that's developing. Any, anything that's, that's developed over time in terms of a, a set of processes or approaches to get your ideas out onto paper and into published form. And then also, um, your books are very user-friendly. Uh, they're very approachable. They're not stuffed with a lot of superfluous language and, and torturous detail. They get right to the point. Um, they're entertaining. Um, they're packed more with meaning than a bunch of unneeded wordage. And so, uh, and also you tell, you, you convey a lot of your information through storytelling. So in line with all of the, the other questions I asked uh, as part of this question, is there something, you know, why is that the right approach for you? And why do you think that's the right approach for your audiences? Well, I mean, man, where do I start, David? I think the first thing that I'll say to anybody listening that has sort of aspired to be a writer is that I, I went through many years of discouragement on it. And I think that, you know, in hindsight, I look back and I realize that I love storytelling. I love a good story, whether it's in a song, you know, I, I think guys like Johnny Cash and Robert O'Keefe that just tell a story so simply, you know, or 
or Wes Anderson and the way he shoots things or, you know, um, you know, books obviously is where you can get to do long form storytelling, but I've always loved stories. And I realize that I come from a family of storytellers and how that's really how we've communicated. And I didn't know it until I started it. So I started doing it formally, but I will say that, you know, I always wanted to write books. Um, and I, you know, and even when I'm, when I'm going through experiences, like right now being the chairman of geek them in 8020, I can see stories that I go, man, that would be really great in a book. Um, but for many years, I didn't have the, the courage and I thought I didn't know how to do it. And, um, and so it was really hard for me. And I used to have, and I remember, you'll probably remember, because I said this to you, I said this to a lot of people that were close to me. I said, well, one day, one day when I write my book, I'm never going to get around to writing. And it was sort of this negative self-talk that I told myself. And so, you know, I just want to encourage anybody out there that you just never know what's going to happen. And I think the first step for me was confiding in telling people close to me like yourself that it was one of the desires of my heart, which, which, which was to write. And I remember two people that really, when I sort of spoke it into the universe, uh, it came back in a really positive way. And I remember one day I was having breakfast with Randy Smith, who's the CEO of Western Urban. And he just stopped and he said, hey, before we go any further, I just need to tell you, you know, I, I, I have a sort of this, uh, something has been on my mind and I just going to tell you real quick, you need to write. Like, that's it. You need to write. And then he moved on with the lunch and I was just so struck by that. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, okay. And, and this was before I'd ever written a single book. And the second story was, I remember I had told you we had had this conversation about writing and, and then you came back one day and you were like, Lorenzo, I was on a, I think you were on a plane coming from a conference somewhere and you were listening to a podcast and they had interviewed Tucker Max who is a you know, four-time New York Times bestselling author. Um, and he had started a company that helps sort of busy people write their books, but, it, but it's them writing it. And, um, and I remember when you told me that, I had this, like, this little glimmer of hope in my heart. And I was like, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe this is the thing that's going to let me write my books. And so I'll never forget it. And on the bottom of Geekdom, where Rosella is right now, used to be my office, which was this crappy you know, uh, just like, you know, uh, drywall falling apart. And, and then it was my office. And I remember we were sitting in there. And so that night, uh -huh. I my expense reports at night, and I ordered in some, some takeout, and I was listening to that podcast you told me about. And I was like, man, I'm going to give this a shot. And, and that's actually how I sort of started. Um, and so this next part is probably, is just, you know, a shameless commercial for Scribe Media, which is the company that, that he started. And, um, and they really helped me project manage my book to completion. And I think I've just loved working with them because they, they pair you with, um, uh, with, a, with a scribe is what they call it. I mean, it, to me, it's, a, it's an editor, it's a professional writer, it's sort of a book architect. And, um, and these were the first sort of professional writers who said, hey, these stories, these stories uh, can help people. And, um, and they walked me through their structured process. That's what I was missing. I was missing structure. I was missing sort of specific tools, like how to do a table of contents, which, you know, when I do one now, it's about 20 pages, right? And so it's more of a roadmap. These are things that I could have never figured out and I had to have help to do it. But now there's a lot of literature and a lot of books on how to do these things. And so I just want to encourage anybody watching that you can get started um, and it doesn't have to be so hopeless because I felt like I went through many years of just almost giving up on the idea going like, man, I'm, I'm never going to get around to doing this. Uh, but I'm really excited. Well, you, you've helped some other local leaders get their stories out via um, some of the, the methods that you've been using, the structure you've been using, correct? Yes, yes. Um, so there's a great um, uh, videography company here called Key Ideas and uh, Carlos Maestas, who's the CEO. Um, we referred him to Scribe and actually he's a Geek the Media um, uh, he's a Geek the Media author, so we actually helped get his book to market. It's called uh, uh, Mommy Lied to God, which is uh, Authentic Lessons in Storytelling. Uh, but also Cheryl Scully's book, um, Greedy Bastards, uh, when, when the CEO of Scribe was in town visiting, uh, we made an introduction to him and Cheryl because she had told me one time, a uh, long time ago, that, that when she retired, she wanted to write a book. And I said, oh, Cheryl, you got to meet these guys. And they, they just were, were, were so good at helping, you know, guide her through the process. And actually, I'm so proud because, you know, Cheryl Scully's book is a great example. She is pumping out numbers that's like New York Times bestseller quantity, 
And it's just so awesome to see someone, you know, do that from San Antonio and not have to go to, you know, New York and pitch all of the publishers there and get rejection letters. She did it as a self right, right out of San Antonio and you can't do it. Well, I think it's, I think it just, it speaks volumes to not only getting your stories and, and your wisdom out, um, to many audiences, including a lot of young people in town who are aspiring for careers in tech, or they're, you know, we're trying to get them to get excited about staying in San Antonio or getting their ideas out there that they could actually aspire to publishing their own content, whether it be books or other things one day, but also just get helping other leaders find a way to get those stories out. So I think it's great for our city and great for the ecosystem. Yeah. So just tremendous. I, I'm going to transition to the book at this point, uh, the new book, The Rack We Built. And um, I'm just going to start right off the top with this quote from former Rack Space chairman, uh, Graham Weston. It's in the introduction of your book. So I kind of take it as perhaps some of the inspiration behind the entire uh, process of writing this book, but also kind of a superstructure that ties almost everything in the book together. And that is this quote that everyone wants to be a valued member of a winning team on an inspiring mission. I mean, it, could you have one short sentence more packed with meaning and information than that? Um, I have a sense, again, that this quote was part of your inspiration for this book. Can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about that, where you first heard it, and how it relates to just the general over, uh, the, the broader arc of this story, this narrative that, that you tell throughout the book? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that that sentence, you know, or I would say even the, is the thesis of the book. And and what's funny is I didn't hear it until my the very end of my nine and a half years of Rack Space. And Graham sort and Graham and a collaborator of his uh, Fred Reichelt sort of you know came up with it or stumbled upon it. And I remember when when I first heard it, I thought to myself, you you think about it and you go, man, that really that's really good. But as time goes on. Every time I hear about an amazing company, an amazing team, it, it could even be in sports, and I, and I run it through the three-part equation, it always works. And I have not found anything better that I've ever read about or seen that describes truly the essence of what a great winning culture is, right? Everyone wants to be a valued member. You know, you want to feel valued. You don't want to feel like you're the B team on a winning team. You want to be winning and when you're not winning you're just so bummed and you can't wait to be winning again and that's why people transfer to other departments that are winning or ultimately you know the, the most dramatic is is you leave the company right to go join another winning team and um uh and uh, and also to be on an inspiring mission which is really you know and this is i think the hardest part in our day because our parents generation went to work for the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, food, water, shelter to provide for their families. They didn't think about the top, which is self-actualization. What brings me happiness? What makes me feel fulfilled? And so I think in today's day and age, that is very important to people, the inspiring mission. I want to know that what I'm doing, right? And, and, I, and I think that in a lot of companies, they fail to see that, that someone getting up to make the investors an extra 10% of their money is just really not exciting to a lot of people and so you in Rackspace right. did a great job because they had those investors just like every other company but that's really not what they told us and so this book is about how as a young 20 year old guy I really fell in love with the mission because it was so real and the leadership did such a good job of bringing it to life in a real way but I would I would challenge anyone to think of the, the most successful company uh, sports team whatever it is that they admire or even individual and run them through that equation, and I, and I know it works every time, for sure. Well, you know what's, what's interesting, and you, you talk about this a little bit, not only if you run it through the equation, you can see all those, th but when there's a breakdown yes. in corporate culture, you can find it, you can find a failure in at least one or more of the legs of that three-legged stool, if you will. Absolutely, and I talk about this at the very end of the book. When I left Rackspace, I believed that I was, uh, we were the winning team. So we were winning in our category and we were still kicking butt and we were growing every month. Um, I was a valued member. My boss loved me, my team, I loved them. It was amazing. Um, and, um, but the mission, I just, I had been there for so long that I just started realizing that the mission uh, wasn't in alignment with what I wanted. And so 
think about that. I had two of the three, right, firing on all cylinders, and I made a personal decision to leave because of the third one. And I think that everyone has to come and reconcile with what their tolerance level is for each one of those three parts of the equation. Because everybody's, but I think it gives you a format to go, well, why am I unhappy? Let me see where the breakdown is. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to pull from a, a quote here from your book, from the introduction again. Um, I'm just going to read it. Graham Weston once said that there were two ideas that were worth a billion dollars of value each. The first one of them was fanatical support. We very corporate culture centric type statement. And the second one was NPS, which we'll get to later. Um, but I found this interesting because it underscores the very direct, direct connection between culture and brand strength slash business value, right? It puts it into monetary terms or financial terms. Can, your, can you share your thoughts on this? And um, maybe the story that kind of brings it home about Graham and when he, when he learned some things about uh, customer uh, satisfaction early on and his decision on where to appropriate money you know, marketing versus some other parts in line with some of this new fanatical support culture that was developing at Rackspace? Yeah, so uh, a great question. And for this part of the book, I interviewed a really important racker named David Bryce, um, who's, who's known of sort of as the godfather of fanatical support. And, um, and, and, you know, him and Graham have both told these amazing stories about in the early days, Rackspace just was not very customer centric. And as a matter of fact, we all know the companies that hate talking to customers, that make it really difficult for you to get a hold of them and have the press one for this, you know, two for this, many, they're just trying to lose you, right? And, and they'll tell you, hey, that's what Rackspace was like in the early days. Um, and then David Bryce, through frustration, through real customer pain, you know, realized we cannot do this, you know, and, and he said, and he quotes Graham, he said, Graham always said that we have a moral obligation to help our customers. And, um, and when he took that to heart, and there was this one, sort of inciting incident where he just got fed up and he said, we're going to provide not just great customer service, but fanatical service. And this was the first core value, real core value that sprung to life at Rackspace, truly authentically, was this notion that we were going to go above and beyond to help our customers. And he says, in, you know, and I write about this in the book, that customers started noticing immediately that, hey, you know, these are the guys that are helpful. These are the guys that don't treat us like we're morons and that will go out of their way to, to stay on the phone with us. And he, and he said that, you know, people started recommending other customers to us and we noticed that fanatical support helped us retain customers, but also there was a lot more people that were being referred to us. And so in the, in the book, in the story, David Bryce says that Graham moved, this is the early days of Rackspace, he moved a million dollars out of the marketing budget and gave it to David Bryce to hire more customer service people because fanatical support was this retention and this referral tool. And when I think about that, you know, I feel like so many businesses chase good strategies and they focus just on strategies. But this is a, an example where you have a strategy and a tactic. The strategy is customer loyalty. How do we get it? You know, how do we retain it? Well, check. Fanatical support fits that criteria, but the tactic is Graham goes, fanatical support is not only working, I am gonna add more gas to the fire. And, and, and tactically move money from this bucket to this bucket to pour more on there and increase that. And sure enough, it, it worked a charm. And I think that this is really what I love about these stories is that these are little business insights that you sort of get from behind the curtain that I think other people should pay attention to. I love that story because it says a couple of things. One, Graham was willing to put his money where his mouth was. Like the corporate um, core values, the culture, it, it wasn't just some... Uh, plat business platitudinal statements that are up on a billboard somebody, somewhere that nobody ever read, right? It was actually guiding investment decisions. And, and also, uh, and also, and also one of the things is that at the time, it was actually um, very unconventional wisdom. All of the investors and the big analysts told them tech companies should not hire more humans. You need to automate everything. And so he was going completely against what the, what the common knowledge of that time was, which was to hire more people to give uh, better customer service. And sure enough, shocker, they were wrong, he was right. Absolutely, absolutely. Very non-intuitive at the time. You know, we were starting Secure Logics around that same time frame, and I, I, we, we had the same kind of pressures, which was automation, things are more about, you know, machine search engines and things like this. Um, 
not so much about populating your company with lots of humans that answer phones, right? That was, the idea was tech was gonna move us away from, from all that. And in fact, I think it, it highlighted the need even more for the human touch uh, as you get into the complication of deploying and maintaining technology. Um, you mentioned David Bryce. He talks about the fact uh, from your book uh, that in his view, culture is sort of the company's personality and core values as the company's immune system, if you will. Can you expand on that a little bit? Talk about the differences between the two. Sometimes people hear culture, they hear core principles or core values. Help people sort you know, the hierarchy there and how they interrelate and connect and reinforce one another. Yeah, I think, uh, great question. I think that well, when David said that, you know, your, your, your culture is the personality of the company. Um, the example I always love is Southwest Airlines. And when you think about their personality, right, you have all of the other airlines and how they do business. And then you have Southwest Airlines that will sing their announcements before the plane takes off, right? Their safety protocols, or they'll act right. it in a dramatic Hamilton way. And you just you gotta love this, right? And, and that's their personality coming out. And I think that it's a great example. You know, your culture is your personality that you project to the outside world. Your core values though, your core values are how every single employee down to the lowest paid person, it's how they view the company and how they bring the mission to life in their day-to-day -day operations, but also in the decisions that they make. And specifically I talk about in the book, the, the decisions of hiring, firing, and what to do when the boss isn't there. These are where I believe your core value um, is sort of a, a guidebook and a, and, a, and, a, uh, and a map so that it helps your employees maneuver. Um, and the culture is what people see on the outside, right? But the core values are what people use to make decisions. And I also think, and I write about this in the book too, that they're brought to life through stories. And, and so many companies have uh, values that just don't mean anything. And they're sort of on the conference room wall, but real core values. And this is one of the things that I'm so thankful for, um, for Graham, for uh, Morris, Lou, Lanham, what they did well, you know, the, the founders, um, Richard, Pat Condon and Dirk Elmendorf, they, they helped bring them to life. And when you take something like fanatical support, you now knew what good and bad looked. And so I could make a decision, do I ignore this call or do I pick it up? The answer is very simple. Fanatical support says that I need to be helpful, that I need to go above and beyond to help these customers. And so it made me as a 20 year old with no college degree and no prior experience and navigate so many issues. And I remember thinking to myself, I had a customer once that was really upset because their website had gone down and they were screaming at me and they wanted a refund. And so here I am, this young 20 year old, and I'm having to make a $5,000 decision. My boss was nowhere to be found. I didn't know where they were. And, and I said, you know, I am doing this because we um, promised them something. We failed in our plan. And so I'm going to do this to keep them here and prove to them that we can come back from this. And I'm going to use Fanatic Report as my guidebook on why I'm doing this. And I remember thinking to myself, and if they fire me, oh, well. And I did it. Nobody got mad at me. And I realized this principle, which was, you're never going to get fired for doing something for the customer when your core values are all about delivering fanatical support. And this was a really great epiphany for me. So the question I have for all the people watching here is, do you have core values at your company that help you make decisions when there's no one around? And that to me is one of the litmus tests of having a real core value or have something that's just on the conference room wall. You know, it's interesting because a lot of times um, as employees, often our intent is good. Right. If we only have clarity about what the company would suggest is in the best interest of the company, but it, it sort of actually there's a clarifying and focusing uh, energy and element to having these core values because then you know, like you say, you know how and where to march out in the best interest of the company when your intent is already positive. That's right. And also, I think that what it, what it does too is, you know, no leader, especially of a small startup, um, has the desire or time to sit with every employee and teach them the personality and the decision-making guide of the company. It's just, it's not feasible. And so right. core values is one of the first ways that a company will think about scaling up 
to becoming a bigger organization is having some rules that we all follow to, in order to make decisions. And I think specifically hiring and firing. Th those are two big ones too. Uh, terrific. Um, I'm going to move on, but drill down a little bit more. Let's talk about core values and, and sort of uh, pull, pull back the curtain a little further on those. I wanted to start, you, you have this in the book, I want to start by reading the list of the core values that were codified at, at Rackspace in its early years. Um, I'll just read down the list. And you talk about one of them actually ended up being kind of a fake core value that later was kicked off the island. But I'll read it um, and include it for now because it was part of the early set. Um, financial support in all we do, number one. Number two, embrace change for excellence. Number three, results first, substance over flash, which kind of broke out as two separate ones later, but for now, we're, we're one core value. Um, the next one, keep our promises. Bad news first, full disclosure, no surprises. Um, the next one, passion for our work. And finally, treat rackers like friends and family. Mm. So with regard to, very interesting. I mean, I, I, it was, you know, I've heard, I've heard rackers and ex rackers talk about the core, the core values of the company. They've mentioned one or two. I've never seen them in a full list. Um, I, I never worked there. Many of us watching never did. It's interesting to see that you can actually, you can really, that, that is the, the, the personality of the rack space that I knew as it was starting and growing and becoming a big story in town that very much feels like rack space to me, those core values. But with regard to developing them in your own company, you mentioned a few things. Um, number one, less is more. Uh, in so many words. Secondly, it's important to get them right. Um, in fact, it might be the most important set of business decisions you, you make um, for the reasons you mentioned before. And thirdly, um, many, they're not manufactured, they're born. And in fact, many times they're born out of adversity in kind of a, a raw moment of crisis where some kind of scaling issue or business issue is, is actually exposing maybe a blind spot with regard to the business. Um, can you share some stories to highlight some of this and then underscore what you mean by, you know, less is more, get them right. And um, they're often born out of adversity, not uh, manufactured when things are great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love these by the way. And I, and the reason that I love them was um, at your earlier point, one of them is really not a real core value, but, but that's okay. And I think that I'm glad that Rackspace didn't have an out of 10 list because most companies don't. And so I want to give you know a lot of grace out there. If you're a company and you have you know one or two fake ones, we had one, you know, and I'll I'll call it out passion for our work. And I just go, hey, you know, who doesn't want that? You know, everybody wants passion. And how does passion help me make a decision when the boss is not there? It fails all of the tests, right? And so, and that's okay because not everybody's going to have a home run. Which is why I always caution people: just start with one. One good core value is better than five fake, five fake ones. You know, one good core value like fanatical support. I mean, I would argue that we could have grown the company for a couple of years off just that one core value, but the leadership of Rackspace, the founders, the executive team, they knew that this was important. And so they invested a lot of time before I even got there. I remember I showed up and there was an orientation video that had these things in them. And so they invested on the front end because they knew that this was really, really powerful. But I'll give you sort of a, a, a more updated version of that. I remember when I was CEO of Geekdom, and uh, I would meet regularly with some of the biggest stakeholders we had. And I remember I was meeting with Michael Girdley, um, who is, you know, the, one of the founders of Code Up. And, um, and I remember we were at Sip Coffee Shop on Houston Street. And he was talking and he was giving me all these great feedback on Geekdom. And he said, hey, Lorenzo, if I was you, I would ask this one question, uh, which is two parts. Is it good for the members? And is it good for the ecosystem? And that's how I would make decisions if I was you. And I said, hang on, Michael. And I took out my notebook and I wrote it down. <laughs> And I said, and I said, that's a core value uh, because I can give that to my staff and say, if I'm not here and you have to make a decision that costs money or, or doesn't ask yourself these two questions, is it good for the members? And is it good for the ecosystem? And if you make a decision that I don't agree with, and that was your criteria, you will not get in trouble. But, but, but Michael Girdley, um, as an outsider to it, gave me a core value that I implemented in Geekdom. And it's because he was coming from this really pure place of wanting it to be better. And I think that most business leaders, if you go dive into your company, almost like a detective, 
and you ask people what these things are and how they make decisions and you ask your customers, these will bubble up. But I think a lot of people feel the need to have five or 10 or whatever it is. But I think start with one solid one. And I think you will see your employees energized by having a tool that helps them do their job. Terrific. Fantastic. I love that. Um, and of course, Girdley is always full of uh, <laughs> pearls of wisdom. I've, I've received a few uh, downloaded into my life before and have benefited from them. That's right. Uh, so I love that story. Um, you know, you also talk about elements or beliefs that, that often don't work best um, or as, even as you say, maybe you're kind of fake core values, but you see them show up a lot in um, mission statements or core value listings from companies that are just way too ambiguous yeah. or kind of morally focused, but not really business focused. You get a lot of talk about, you give examples of be honest or have integrity. Uh, it's all relative. And, and how do you, you know, but one of the things to dive a little deeper and it's, you know, I think it's particularly topical in today's world is this whole concept of diversity. And I love how you take what is often kind of a contentious, um, very uh, more confined discussion of diversity and you, and you blow it up into a much more macro meta level discussion, which is that, I'll quote from your book, that diversity is, is more about ideas and skills and experiences um, and less about fair representation or what people look like. Um, right. Not that, and you, you, make, you make it very clear in the book that it's not that that doesn't matter, that fair representation is not a thing. It does matter. Right. But when you're trying to build a company, you're, you're actually, there's a more meta version of, of diversity that you really should be prioritizing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I don't think society talks about that enough today, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I think that, you know, um, I'm sure there'll be some people that disagree with how I phrase it, but I, I think that this part of the book comes from a place of frustration for me because I've seen so many leaders take the topic like diversity um, and really brush it off. And they, and they talk a big game about it and, and their actions, right? Their, their, their words are this way and their actions are this way. And I think that when I've seen it done well, it's not a checklist. And I'll just, I'll give you a couple of stories. You know, I think that um, I remember one time, or actually let me start with a story in the book. So when I'm in the book, when I, when I write about this section, I tell the story of the very first Muslim I ever met, which was an engineer at Rackspace. And I'm, you know, I moved to London and prior to going to London through Rackspace, I'd only been on one plane ride. I'd really rarely ever left the, you know, 13 block radius of my house. And so right. I'm seeing this guy um, who has a belief system that is just very foreign to me. And, uh, and he invited me to dinner because at the time I was living in a corporate flat way on the outskirts of town. I was super lonely. And, and, uh, and so he took me out to eat and we had this amazing talk about, uh, about Islam, Christianity, Tupac and, uh, and, rap and it was just so amazing to me. And I, I, and I remember thinking to myself, man, I'm so glad that I, that I met this guy's name show up. But when I look back at diversity, Rackspace UK did not have a checklist saying, do we have Christian, Buddhist, um, is, you know, um, uh, Muslims uh, to hire from? They said, we have, a, we have a role, which is we need a super duper amazing level three Windows engineer. And of all the candidates, Shoab was the very best one for the job. And I think that to me, what they needed was the skills and ideas that he had. And I think that, you know, what frustrates us about diversity is that we do see so many people that fall victim to getting people and hiring people that look and think like them. But I actually think it starts with people that think like you first and then they happen to look like you. And I think that this is really um, what leads to sort of mediocrity, which is whenever you have radical ideas, a lot of times they just look very different than you. And that's really what you want. I remember a story, so this story is not in the book, but I remember I was in a one-on-one -on -one with Graham and he was explaining one of the reasons that he liked working with me. And I'll never forget it. He drew a rectangle on the whiteboard and he drew a line. And he said, on this side, you have uh, strategic thinking and ideas. And on this side, you have execution. And he goes, in my strength, I love ideas. But when it comes to executing, he goes, I get an A plus in ideas and I get an F in execution. And, and then in this line in the middle, I also get an F right now, which is transferring my ideas 
to people with strengths that can execute. He goes, and when I hired you, Lorenzo, I still get an A in ideas, and I still get an F in executing, but now I get an A plus in handing it over to the perfect partner. And I went, man, that's exactly right. I am not an idea guy. I am an executing guy. I love executing ideas that I, I would have never come up with the idea for Geekdom or for you know asymptomatic COVID testing, right? Which is Graham's current project. But I love executing on those ideas. But Graham wasn't saying I need to hire a Hispanic male with no college degree. That wasn't his checklist. His checklist was, I need to hire someone that has radical skills and ideas different from mine. And you know what? It doesn't matter what he looks like, right? I need the best person for the job. And I think that so many people lose sight of that um, because we're used to people doing it badly, where they just hire someone that looks like them. But going to your previous point, I do think that this is one of the crux of the problem is that it all starts with leadership. A leader either cares about diversity or they don't. And you're not gonna make a leader that doesn't care about it, care about it through guilting and shaming him in social media, right? Graham is someone who showed me through his actions that he actually cares about diversity and taught me to do the same when I'm hiring people. And so this is where I write in the book, there are so many CEOs that will start a diversity um, uh, role or a division within the company. But I would say, hey, let's look at their board of directors. Let's look at their C-levels. Has that move actually manifest in real diversity? And if it hasn't, I would argue it's because it all starts at the top. And so that's where I sort of stray from the conventional wisdom of, of this thought. But I think that if you focus on ideas and skill sets, you'll get a, be you'll get a better showing of diversity. Well, I mean, I, I commend you a lot because, again, with, with the discussions out there today, um, the tone around this topic in society, it would be very easy for you just to leave it out of the book. Um, even though you have some strong opinions and ideas about how we can actually move towards more outcomes versus gestures, I would suggest, right? As part of your message. Yeah. And actually um, I, I thought about leaving it out. And the reason I did it was because I do feel that there are a lot of people that make meaningless gestures towards diversity and, and it's an injustice to me. And I said, you know, and, and specifically the CEO is the one who is in the greatest position to do this. And I think I've just watched a lot of them uh, create a role and it's their way of getting out of doing anything and making real change. Right. Well, I, I thought it was fantastic that you decided to go ahead and include it because I think it's leadership like that leadership in terms of um, the expansion of our discussion and new ideas and new ways of reframing things that will get us to the other side of perhaps getting a more, unified view of what it really takes to build true positive outcomes around diversity. Um, let's talk about the uh, back to core values. You, you, I found this very interesting. Uh, you also talk about, you know, there's, there can be too much of, of a good thing. Uh, core values, even when they're perfectly tuned, if you will, um, or near perfectly tuned, they can be, there can be a dark side. Uh, they can be weaponized inside a company uh, and used either socially or politically to kind of justify certain actions um, or take the business in a direction that might actually not be uh, the best set of decisions. Can you, um, can you uh, talk to people about what to look out for on that front and maybe give an example or two of what, what, what you saw at Rackspace and how that played out over time? Yeah, yeah, uh, I love that. And, and I remember I was talking to a great friend of mine um, he is a, he's, he's from South Africa and we met, uh, when we were working in the UK office together, his name's Pravesh Mistry and Pravesh and I were actually talking about this and he was the one who sort of planted this idea in my head and he's, he was running a sales division and he said, the sales guy came in totally hung over and late and with a straight face, the sales rep said, Hey, so I know one of our core values is full disclosure. And I just want to tell you, I went out and got wasted last night and that's why I'm late. And, uh, and we you know, went off to his desk, like all was well. And, and I thought to myself, you got to be kidding. And I remember that I was like, I got to put it in the book because this sales rep was using a core value as an accomplice for bad behavior. And so he was saying, Hey, I'm living the core value. I'm telling you the truth, which is I got totally smashed last night and now I'm showing in super late for work. And I just went, you know, there is a right and a wrong way to use your core values. And this is why I think the best defense for core values stories because when the company says this is a story of the core value working and this is not you compare everything to the stories that work and that is how people 
uh, behave and they reverse engineer their behavior on the stories that the leadership props up of your core values and them doing it well, which is why I think that it's so important for the leader to set the example. When the leader sends the company email and says, let me tell you about what David Hurd did. It was amazing. And he lived out our core value X, Y, and Z by doing this thing or there. Everyone's taking note of what it is and what it's not. And I think that, it, you know, as you get bigger, you will have people use your core values. And so, you know, one, another one is um, embrace change for excellence. And this was a tricky one because um, used in the wrong hands, it would say, I have license to change everything all the time, which is actually not what it was, right? It was about, hey, we know sometimes we're going to have to make some serious radical changes, but there was a process. There was a problem we were always solving right? And there was, a, there was always a beta test. And once we beta tested it, we would roll it out thoughtfully. Whereas someone could come in and say, hey, embrace change. Um, I'm going to make a huge land grab because I have a ginormous ego and I want more direct reports to boss around. And I'm going to use that core value as a way to go steal someone else's you know, uh, department or division. That's really using as an accomplice for bad behavior. Really interesting, um, and I like I like that the book is kind of full, fully well rounded that way, where you where you talk about the light and the dark to all of this, right? Um, I think that's super important. Um, let's talk about the importance of communicating core values through stories. Mm. And I was struck in the book. I mean, I was thinking about my my, my experience at my own company, where um, the extent to which you recommend that companies formalize the capture of stories around um, behaviors that reinforce the core values, and then also think very intentionally and proactively about how those stories get shared internally and externally, uh, employees and customers. And you and I, one of the, one of the, we've worked on so many things at Tech Block, I've lost count, but one of the most fun things we did was, was uh, host Reed Hastings, uh, co founder and uh, CEO of, of Netflix, the San Antonio beautiful theater event uh, about this time last year. And, you know, Netflix and Reed are um, kind of super famous for uh, their core principles around culture and the communication of those. They do it public, almost open source, if you will, on the Internet. Um, can you can you can you talk about uh, that whole aspect of what you think leaders should be doing today, the best ways to capture and communicate? And then what what struck you that night with regard to Reed and, and sort of the parallel views that he had with regard to this? The, you know, there's this set of important issues for, for business growth. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I think that the, the best cultures have a mechanism for capturing, uh, maintaining, and spreading the stories that bring their culture to life. And Netflix is a really great one. Um, you know, they have a famous document about their culture that anybody can Google. It's a living document that they update all the time. I'm sure that when you start at, um, at Netflix, there's probably a couple of sessions where you go through it and it's probably facilitated. I don't know that, but I'm just guessing. Um, Sheryl Sandberg said, and I write this in the book, that it's the most important document, one of the most important documents to ever come out of the Valley. And, um, and I think that as you observe cultures that really have tremendous, uh, sorry, companies that have tremendous cultures, you will see that they all have their own version of this. Um, I write down, uh, and I write a little bit about Texas A&M, right, it's a tier one university. And they're famous for something called Fish Camp, which is like a two-day event where all of their incoming freshmen go, and they get indoctrinated about what their culture is. And there's a whole website devoted to their values, their traditions, and their principles. And so they just think about that. They have infrastructure. Not only do they have the tech presence, they have an event. It's facilitated by real people, right? There's curriculum to go through. There is a whole infrastructure when I was at Rackspace, we started doing this through something called Rookie-O or Rookie Orientation, where we would bring all of the new hires through, and I write about this in the book as well, and they would bring in the divisions to talk about these things. Graham would actually do a session on strength finders. The, the founders of the company would come in and tell the founding story. And so everybody walk, walked through there, but think about that. That is one week of all of your new employees' time not adding to the bottom line. But it's so important to get them caught up and, in, and, and indoctrinated or drinking the Kool-Aid, whatever you want to call them, that you're using all of that salary for that amount of time. It's just really important. I think about other companies like Zappos. Uh, Tony Shea wrote an amazing book called Delivering Happiness, where he has all the stories about the, the original founding 
you know, of the company, how it grew. Um, uh, I can never pronounce his name, but the, uh, but the owner of Patagonia wrote an amazing book called Let My People Go Surfing. Um, and it's such a great book because he talks about the culture and talks about how they make decisions. And I just think great companies are very intentional about collecting and sharing those stories. I should have brought some pictures of me at fish camp when I went to a <laughs> and uh, I did go through fish camp. And let me tell you, it works because I remember going to my first a and football game as a student. It was against LSU. It was the night game. I'm a freshman. I had not even been to class yet because it was an early season football game. But I had been to fish camp, and I knew all of the yells and what to do. That's right. As if I had gone to A&M for four years. I hadn't, again, I hadn't even, hadn't even opened up a, a book yet and started to study. So, um, Three parts. Valued member, winning team, inspirement. You felt like you were on the team before you'd even been to class because I knew the yells. I knew exactly how to participate in my winning team's traditions. It's true. I, I remember actually feeling like the weight of the entire, the, the fate of the game was on my shoulders if I didn't yell loud enough. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was quite something. Um, so, I, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about, I, I love the transparency and honesty of the book as well, because you, you spend a lot of time talking about um, how the core values built the company with explosive growth helped you feeling like a valued member of the team on a mission um but but you very honestly discuss a period um you know that had a you know it had its good and its bad but it was a period where you went to london and it really tested some of your beliefs and attitudes around your fit at Rackspace at that time. Yeah. And in particular, you talk a little bit about the concept between um, uh, social contracts and core values and how they're, they interrelate, they're very important, they reinforce one another, but they're not the same thing. And it felt like to me, it was kind of the social contract part where some of the rub was happening in London between you know, kind of their approach in London and the approach of the office in the US, even though there was great alignment, there was enough difference there to where um, you were losing some of your energy at some level. Can you talk about that period a little bit and then it kind of what you maybe underscore the difference between social contracts and core values? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for bringing up this part of the book because uh, one of the things that I try to do in, in, my, in my writing, and I don't always do it to the extent that I'm happy with, but um, I, I always want to put something in there about um, the downside of myself. And what I mean by that is in this, in this section that you're referring to, I'm trying to write about the times I didn't handle myself well. And I think that when I look at that period or when I look at the times in my career, um, when I don't handle myself well, it's probably because I wasn't feeling valued. Um, and that's sort of, that was sort of an internal thing. And so in this part of the book, um, I did not handle myself well. And I'll just tell you, I mean, another way to say it was, I, I didn't have the professional maturity to deal with what I was dealing with. Um, and so I acted out in very unhealthy ways. I would say in even very immature ways. I had a big mouth. Um, people liked listening to me so I could tell a story and it was a bad story. And so I write about these things because I do think there's a lesson there, which is how to, how to handle toxic people because I was toxic for a season um, and, and how to avoid that. And so to get to your question about sort of social contracts, you know, um, I, I borrow that idea from an author named Dan Ireland who wrote about it in a book called Predictably Irrational. And the example he uses is if, if you ask me to help you move and I, I go, of course, we're friends, I go help you move. And then he pulled out your checkbook and tried to pay me, I'd say, don't be ridiculous, you're crazy. Um, because you are now mixing a market contract with a social agreement. And because I'm socially connected to you, I will help you even more. And, and the way this translates in businesses in this particular story, when I moved to the UK, was I was used to a social agreement in the US that said something like, hey, uh, if there's a big change or really any change, um, let us know your questions and we'll do our best to walk you through it. Now, that doesn't mean you get a vote, doesn't mean that you can derail it, but we're happy to explain it to you. And what happened is, this is not all of the UK, I just happened to have one or two managers that, that uh, in the organization that were like this, and it was, hey, don't ask me questions, I'm the boss, do what I tell you. And so I went from a social agreement that was, hey, we are gonna explain it to you so we can get your buy-in. 
Um, and ultimately, if you don't buy in, we're still going to explain to you and we're going to override you, which I was fine with, to a social agreement that said, don't ask me any questions. I'm telling you what to do. Go do it. And that is when I had a very negative reaction and that I just didn't handle it well. And because I, because when you tear up a contract, a social contract, you feel hurt, you feel betrayed. And what I felt was very angry. And I was, and, and in my immaturity, I was almost stomping on the ground and saying, this is not how we do it at Rackspace. This is not how the culture is supposed to be. And instead of pitching my case, I just turned into uh, what I would say a, a cultural, uh, a cultural misfit. And, um, and I just, and, and so what happened is it set me back because my brand, which was this amazing, hardworking Lorenzo became sort of this bitter, angry Lorenzo. And I had to work several years to get out of that funk and be productive again. Uh, because I let the bad social contract really sour my, uh, uh, sour my performance, even though I was operating at the top of my game, you know, my customers loved me, my stats were impeccable, but I really, really, I handled it. Uh, I didn't handle it well. And I'll tell you that social contracts, what I talk, refer to them as is the rules of the prison yard. This is how people behave outside of the core values when no one's watching at the water cooler. And I think that every company has them. And if you look across an organization, you will see them. One of the ones we had in my team was because our team were super close together, we, we, we sat uh, so that we could see each other, is that if someone was on the phone getting yelled at by a customer, we had a social agreement. You don't just sit there, you help them out. If, if they need your help logging on the server, if they need you to conference in on the call, man, you're ready to do it. But that was a social agreement that we had and every company and every team I would say has them. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think you did spot on. Um, it, and it's an interesting, it's, 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 um, it's an in, in, interesting differentiation between the two. And I found that that layer of, of information and that layer of storytelling in the book, you know, I was seeing interesting. I was seeing a lot of, we can all come up, a couple of, come up with our own examples or experiences from our work life or careers where we can see, Oh, okay, this is, this is actually what was going. That was actually a social contract. Um, uh, lack of harmony on my part during this period. And this was another core value issue, what have you. Yeah. And also, um, one of the things I want to add to that story is that, um, cause it's really important to me personally is that in that time, you know, my peer group were absolutely amazing. I mean, when I was in the UK, I worked with some of the smartest, hardest working, most amazing people, uh, most diverse teams I've ever worked on. It was, it was when it came out of our peer group to our management level, that's really when I did struggle with them. But yeah. I loved learning from and working with my peers in that office. And it was just tremendous. So it, it really wasn't about them. It was my inability to maturely and professionally maneuver a management system that I was coming into conflict with. Well, it's interesting because you talk a lot, you take it all the way through to the journey to ultimate IPO 2008. New York Stock Exchange listing. They're ringing the bell in New York leadership. You guys have your cowboy, the cowbells back here in San Antonio ringing along with it. Tremendous celebration, kind of a sense of arrival. And yet that things were going to be changing because shareholder value and things like this were, become, were going to become primary. Um, look, there's a lot to this story and a lot that you could share, but that whole period and, and your ultimate um, departure from Rack's, Rackspace also really um, gave you an insight, a series of insights and some wisdom into the, the kind of cor corporate cultural changes, no, no matter how strong those core values were leading up to that point in time. Um, there's a sense from you that they started to unwind, that priorities were shifting. Maybe it was for the better, maybe not. Reasonable people can disagree. But I guess what I'm left with is this. What did, what did you learn from that period? And also, is it just inevitable that as a startup scales and grows, you reach some kind of critical mass point to where you just can't hold on to that, those startup core value principles anymore? Um, or is it the case like ne what Netflix would argue and maybe Zappos where, no, you, you can do it, but it's very, very tough and you got to fight like hell to hold on to them because the natural forces, the gravitational pull is against you. Yeah. Where do you come down on that? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think the first thing that the IPO taught me was I didn't know, you know, uh, I didn't know what going IPO meant other than what they had explained to us. 
Um, and you really don't know until after it happens that you sort of see the, the shift. And so I was very naive from a business sense of what going public really meant and what it was going to do to our culture. And, and by the way, you know, it wasn't really amazing thing that we did. We were able to grow and hire a bunch of people that we just couldn't have done without doing it. But I was very naive. Um, I also, so I was naive about what it meant. I was also very naive about this notion that a company can grow and be billions of dollars and we can all, you know, ring the bell together. I was also very naive about that. Um, and then I went through later on this sort of cynic phase where I just thought it's impossible. It's just impossible. But the more I research it, the more I realized it is possible. But to your point, it's just really freaking hard. And I think that, and so you go, you have to sort of have a leadership team that says we, we, we care enough about this to pick this fight and to set up the infrastructure so that we can fight this fight together as we grow. And so I think that, you know, um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was for someone else. I don't want someone else to experience the naivety that I had going into it. I want them to see it for really what it is, you know, in all of its, in all of its good, bad, and ugly, right? But also, I have come to the realization that I think that the companies that care about culture are really the special ones. And I think that they're the ones that, that shine a light out there, especially when, when we live in an era where capitalism has such a bad rap. And I love capitalism. And I think that, that capitalism has been rebranded to mean that entrepreneurs don't care about the environment. They don't care about their workers. Their goal is to just uh, exploit everybody, to exploit the earth, and, um, and, then just, and then laugh all the way to the bank. And when I look at these little companies, you know, like Patagonia and Netflix, I go, I really admire their culture and them trying to fight the good fight because I think more companies need to be like them. If more companies were like them, I actually think that capitalism would have a way better brand. Absolutely. It's, um, I just found that whole discussion interesting because it was a really insider view of, you know, we would read the headlines about things happening at Rackspace with, with IPO and it's, it's huge growth and all, but it was, it was for a non-racker, it was really interesting to get kind of one person's inside perspective on it. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy reading, reading that's another reason I think they'll enjoy the book. Um, interestingly, um, after a private equity buyout in 2016, uh, Rackspace in 2020 went IPO again and is now, you know, back on the public market. Um, some, some interesting new leadership and direction. Um, Rackspace is still such a vital part of our tech ecosystem in San Antonio, such a critical part of our city. Um, what do you see when you look at Rackspace today? Well, I mean, I think um, for me, I, uh, when I see Rackspace, I'm just terribly fond of it. Uh, you know, I, I, every time I drive by a building where we once were housed, you know, whether it be the old Broadway Bank building, Data Point, the castle, um, I just, I have such a big soft spot for it because A, of how it really changed my career and changed my life. And, and, and honestly, the work that I do at Geekdom, writing the books, Tech Block, all of this was um, in part motivated by and influenced by my time at Rackspace. You know, Rackspace wasn't just a tech company for me. It was a company that, that took a chance on a 20-year-old inner city Hispanic guy with no college degree and gave me skills and a network um, and things that I didn't have that the business world valued that, that I was lacking. And so it really changed my life and that's not hyperbole. And so I love Rackspace for that reason because I actually think there are hundreds if not thousands of other stories like that for people who it gave a shot to. And when I think about the ecosystem down here, I think every one of these companies could be that next Rackspace hiring that next Lorenzo Gomez. And so that really is inspiring when I think about Rackspace. I also think the second thing I think is how many amazing rackers are there. And, I, and I'm so proud when, you know, you'll see someone like Brett Pyatt at Jungle Disc and he's on his like third or 10th company. And I, and I just, I love it. But I also think about guys uh, like the teammates I had, um, like Kevin Holmes, who was one of my engineers uh, whenever I was a manager there. And these are just amazing people that I know are still serving their customers to the highest degree, setting the standard. And I just also, I also think it's cool that there's, it, it's a building full of so much talent. And I know for a fact that every recruiter in the world is dying to get their greedy mitts in there and steal it all. So I see it as this beautiful place that's, that's 
that's worth protecting or fighting for. And I'll tell you, you know, just like I write about in the book, it all starts at the top. The leadership sets the tone. And I have met Kevin Jones uh, once or twice, and he's just an amazing leader. And so I'm really inspired about this next generation of Rackspace um, uh, with him as the captain, because I think he's a, just a tremendous human being. And I, and I already see some of the things that I've watched, you know, reading the articles of what they're doing. And so I'm just really excited about their future because I think it is powered by people. It's always been that way. It's never been about the tech at Rackspace. And so I think that if they keep to that principle of having just really amazing people work there, I think that there's, you know, um, the sky's the limit for them. Absolutely fantastic. San Antonio still needs a very healthy and vibrant rack space and the prospects, I think, continue to look amazing. They've got great people there. They always have. They, always. they still do and always will, I think. Um, very quickly before we close, I mean, we, we have to recognize in the, in the world of, of discussions around corporate culture that we are having a very unusual 2020. I mean, even just uh, startup week, here we are doing this virtually as an online event. You and I would normally be sitting, I don't know, on a couple of stools in the Geekdom Event Center doing this before a live audience if this were any other year. Uh, can you talk a little bit, you know, just briefly about, you know, there's everyone's work from home, right? Some people have started to go back to the office, depending on what kind of business you work for. Um, but a lot of work from home still happening. Discussion about how much uh, a, a full return to office there will be following, um, you know, any resolution of what this pandemic um, actually looks like. What's, you know, there's also been a lot of discussion about how do you build corporate culture? How do you enhance it and imbue it um, across the business when you're in a work from home extended virtualized experience as a company? Can you talk a little bit about all of this in the context of corporate culture and, and your thoughts around being face-to-face -face and, and how that may or may not matter? Yeah, I think, um, I think that in light of the pandemic and the whole world going remote, I think that it has shown us that culture is more important. It's more, it's more important now than it ever has been uh, because if your values are real, if the mission is inspiring, um, it can transcend these difficulties and, and, and give your employees the gasoline it, it needs to sort of withstand this. And I think a couple things that I'll say, the first one is technology has always just been a tool and I'm, I'm quoting uh, Mark Andreessen here, technology has always been a tool. Um, it's never been the main thing, right? And so the whole world just got uh, uh, a really in-depth workshop on how to use Zoom and WebEx and all the tools, right? And so now everyone has this tool at their fingertips I do think, and again, I am very biased because I work in a co-working space where I'm in now, which we're social distancing, mask wearing, you know, we, we're doing uh, testing every week. But I, and I think that human beings are very communal and, uh, and they're social beings and so they crave it, whether it's right here in the Zoom or in person. And so I think that one of the lessons that Rackspace taught me was when I moved to the UK office and when they started their Australia office and their Hong Kong office, the only thing that gives you a shot to keep your mission on, on point and to keep your values alive, sorry, to, to keep, to keep the, the organizations humming together is your values and your culture. And so if our core values and our mission was BS, there's no way that the UK or the other uh, remote offices would have survived. And in fact, Rackspace did an amazing job. And I'll tell you that there were many times when the U.S. was struggling revenue-wise, when the U.K. picked up and, and, all, and, and vice versa. But the, the core values, fanatical support, the Inspire mission, they translated to every office and everyone came up with their own way of bringing it to life. And I think that it doesn't have to be a remote office. It can be a remote employee. And if they're real, these things will translate, right? And so if you're doing your traditions and if you're bringing them to life, all of these things can be put into the remote work setting. I would argue that it can't be done over a long period of time, but that's just my one man's opinion. But I do think that having these rules and these principles actually help you withstand the long term of not being uh, face to face. I love that. It's, we're all gonna have to figure, you know, this is happening in real time. So we're all gonna have to kind of figure this out as we go. But I think your comments are a good general framework and roadmap for, for how some of this will play out and hopefully a healthy way for us to to grow and maintain and build corporate culture. We're gonna close out here, but quickly, just an outro question. 
you know, this is your third book. Um, one has to wonder, uh, or I guess assume that this isn't your last. Um, what's next for Lorenzo Gomez? You got some more books in you, and if so, is there anything you can share about potential topics of interest that we should look out for on the horizon? Yeah, I uh, um, <laughs> and and you know you know better than most people, David, because I've talked to you about it, you know, very personally. <laughs> but I there's I mean I have a lot of books in my to quote uh, Thirty Rock uh, in my mind grapes that I want to bring out to the world, and um, and it's everything from topics like gentrification. I have a marketing book that I want to write here pretty soon uh, that just with the principles that have really helped me even selling books. Um, and, and, uh, so there's topics like that. I have my fourth book, the first draft manuscript done already, but as, uh, as Hemingway once said, all first drafts are garbage. So, you know, I, that one has a lot of work to do. Um, there is another book I am in a, my second book was on mental health. I have, there is a book I want to write on mental illness. Um, specifically I have a family member who is a diagnosed, a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. And so there is a book um, that I want to write about that topic in a, a little bit similar way that I did with letters uh, that I did. Um, and so I have a couple of them, but I think that, you know, what I want to end the on and what, uh, what I want to leave the audience with is that I think that we are in the beginning of a wave of original content from San Antonians. And I just am really excited to, 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 to submit my little piece of it to our ecosystem. And I always think about, I always wonder, and, and for my age, I always think about what did Seattle look like before the grunge scene exploded? Like, I was like, what? You know, Cause like all of a sudden this couple of years, like it was Pearl Jam and it was Soundgarden, it was, it was everybody, right? And, I, and I, that's what I think about San Antonio is it is about to explode with all of this creativity, whether it be, uh, whether it be writing, whether it be video storytelling, whether it be music, our film scene, I really do think we're about to explode and become the next creative hub. And so I'm just so excited to read the other Tech Block members' creative projects that they're going to put out there. Um, right. and, and so it's just exciting to be a little piece of it from, from my neck of the woods. I think that is the perfect, positive, optimistic note to end on, by the way, one of your five strengths from Clifton is positivity, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes. I think that is a truly Lorenzo-esque way to close out on a positive note. And I and I also think it's true. I think you're, you're, you're onto something there. Uh, Lorenzo, thank you so much for bringing this uh, in-depth interview to our viewers, uh, Startup Week. And of course, we'll be marketing this to, to Tech Block members and Geekdom members and San Antonio Tech Dizians alike. Um, congratulations again on, on your book launch. Again, everybody viewing, uh, the name of the book is The Rack We Built. Uh, it's an incredible deep dive into corporate culture, but also a lot of fun stories about the wild ride that was Rackspace as it scaled and grew um, from year 1999 up through uh, present day. So um, do yourself a favor and get a hold of a copy. Uh, and with that, Lorenzo, I'm going to go ahead and thank you again and close out. Thanks to all of our viewers for your time today. And we will see you at the next uh, San Antonio Startup Week event. Thank you, David. Thank all the everybody watching. We appreciate it so much. Go buy the book.